Hi, this is Dr. Bill Moreau. I'd like to welcome you to this presentation on the pre-participation examination. In the state of Oregon, the Oregon rules allow for doctors of chiropractic to perform the PPE with the small caveat that the DC must be trained in the cardiovascular examination. Each of us is trained in the cardiovascular examination when we attended our chiropractic college education. However, there are certain important and specific nuances of the cardiac examination and the pre-participation examination that's very important that we're aware of. And we need to make sure that we know what we need to know before we attempt to perform these exams. In my mind, there's no doubt that a well-trained doctor of chiropractic can perform this examination as well as any other clinician of any other specialty or scope of licensure. On this slide, you see on the lower right-hand side a manual. Now, this is the standard of care, the fifth edition of the pre-participation physical evaluation. Now, several academies and groups of physicians came together to create this manual. Uh, chiropractic was excluded as pretty much expected. Once again, really for no other reason other than the basic disgruntlement between professions. Even with that though, the manual is still basically the current reference for how to perform a pre-participation examination. If you're doing pre-participation examinations, you should have a desk reference to support what you're doing. And this is the manual that I would recommend. This presentation is sponsored by NCMIC and we're very appreciative of their support of the chiropractic profession. NCMIC does not ask me to do anything in regards to the content of the presentation. The things that we talk about today are my opinion and my opinion alone. I'm not representing the University of Western States, NCMIC, or the ACBSP, nor am I setting standards of care or providing health care recommendations for the patients you see. The listener participant is encouraged to seek out their own references. You never know, any speaker can misspeak or say the wrong word, but it's your responsibility as a chiropractic physician to ensure that the information that you're applying to your patient care is both current and evidence guided. So here I am. I basically started practice actually a long time ago. It's strange how the years have rolled by, four decades. I started in uh, rural Iowa and I worked there for about three decades, then spent the 10 years prior to coming to the University of Western States at the United States Olympic Committee where I headed medicine. And uh, first chiropractor in the world to be a chief medical officer at an Olympic game and I have to say I'm pretty proud of that. But the reason is that a well-trained doctor of chiropractic can lead healthcare at any level, including the highest levels. And so at the USOC, I did learn quite a bit about the types of examinations that are done with elite athletes with the hopes that those highest level learnings can then percolate down through society and help the people that we see every day on Main Street and in your offices. Let's see if we can bring some things together to help you today. When you do a PPE, you have to understand what's the goal? Why are we doing a PPE? Well, actually there's quite a few different reasons, but the main thing is to determine the general and psychological health status. Now the psychological health status that's something new. That's one of the big changes in the most recent reference change in 2019. We started to deal with the psychological health evaluation. I would encourage each of you to start to incorporate basic two question, three question depression screening in your everyday patients. Mental health has a lot to do with our overall health. And if we're truly holistic in our approach, 
we need to also have a good understanding of our patient's mental health status. Clearly, one of the big things that everybody would know is we're trying to find conditions that could threaten the athlete's or person's life or disable them. And then we're looking for other conditions that might predispose them to a, an injury or an illness. And we also provide that opportunity to discuss health and lifestyle related issues. But you know, for many communities, uh, these young athletes, maybe because of economic status or where they live, they might not have another opportunity to engage with a healthcare provider for that entire year. So it's really important that as you perform the examination, I assume with the support of your staff, that you're alert for the signals that they would like to talk to you or they have a question to ask. And we should be non judgmental and allow the individual to pose any question they choose to question that they would just like to learn about. And as a chiropractic physician, it's well within our scope to discuss basically any health concern. The tire meets the road in the PPE primarily through the clearance decision. That's the part of the form that you will sign at the very end that essentially says that this person is cleared to participate in sport, that they must have follow up regarding a particular topic before they can participate in sport or they're disqualified from sport. It's really unlikely that you're going to totally disqualify an individual. I think that uh, some of the data that we look at will say basically 0.3% of PPEs result in a disqualification of an athlete from participation. The goal is, is to have the individual participate in a physical activity that's suitable for them, recognizing that everybody is an individual with their own challenges, their own concerns, we need to help enable individuals to be physically active, not disable people through restrictions that aren't actually necessary. So what about this athlete? Here you can see a cheerful young athlete and uh, a volleyball player, and she has glasses on. What does it mean to us in the PPE if the person has glasses? Simple observation would tell us that we should just be aware of it. However, it's a little bit more important than that. Is there a time when visual acuity is restricted to the point where it comes into the considerations of what we're doing on our clearance decisions? And the answer is yes, it is. And you have to know what visual acuity is a visual acuity that would result in serious consideration for restriction of activity. What about an athlete with a history of sickle cell syndrome? By law in the United States, every infant is tested for their sickle cell trait. You will learn that about eight to 10% of African Americans have a significant sickle cell trait that needs to be known. Very few Caucasians essentially a small part of 1% and about half of 1% of Hispanics. Also people that lived in an area where malaria is prevalent can have sickle cell. So sickle cell is pretty important. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about it as well as how do you manage individuals that have a positive sickle cell problem. What about the athlete with hypertension? Well, this is going to be the most common finding that you'll see on a pre-participation exam that requires you to make decisions. Hypertension can be a contraindication to sport play. And we know that young people are getting heavier and heavier in their weight and less and less physically active. So it is really common even to see middle schoolers present with hypertension. At the end of the course, you're going to know exactly how to manage an athlete with hypertension. You'll also know which numbers are the big numbers for you to know in regards to the systolic and diastolic blood pressures that will lead you or guide you to your restrictions.
What about the athlete who has a positive history of a sports related concussion? What type of things must we consider for these individuals? In the PPE, there's some very specific questions, procedures and tests that should be performed on them. And we'll talk about them as we go through the course. So that's another significant finding. How about the athlete with what we call a solitary organ, which would mean the loss of a paired organ. It could be a kidney, a lung, an eye, an ovary, a testy, essentially anything that we have two of, we have two of because it's pretty important to us. So what about the athlete that perhaps had an undescended testicle that was surgically managed? What do we do with them? Are there restrictions for that individual? And what about the individual that has one ovary? Is there a restriction for that individual? You'll know the answer by the end of this course. So what's new? In 2019, I mentioned there was an update. Well, what's the new update? As, as I previously stated, part of the questionnaire now address mental health. You know, there's a tsunami of mental health problems coming and we need to hone our tools and skills to recognize, identify, manage, and refer what needs to be referred. In a, another important area is the female athlete. In the old days, we used to talk about the female triad. The triad, three components of disordered eating, decreased bone density, and changes in the menstrual cycle. Well, now that's no longer called the female triad. It's now called REDS, R-E-D apostrophe R -E -D slash S, Reduced Energy Deficit Syndrome. We'll talk briefly about that. Excluding the menstrual cycle problems, we found that actually male athletes can have disordered eating that influences their bone composition. I distinctly recall the case of a really pretty famous triathlete in the United States. He was on a Wheaties box, so I guess he's a pretty big deal. But he presented with groin pain, which actually turned out to be a pubic rami insufficiency fracture. Isn't that interesting that even though he's a male, we think that they should have strong bony tissues, but we have to recognize that they can also have the exact same diseases. When you think about the transgender athlete, I think that's a great thing for us to talk about. You'll find really very little in the literature to help you with your decision making around the transgender athlete. At the Olympic level, it's a pretty big deal because if a person was born as a male and they're in transition, they may have higher testosterone levels than their opponents, which could be perceived to give them competitive advantage. The IOC has been grappling with this for over 15 years, and they really don't have an answer for how are they going to manage to that. How about the athletes with disability? Well, fortunately, at least from my perspective, I had 10 years of experience working with the United States Paralympic athletes. And I really have to question the terminology athletes with disability. When those Paralympians to an individual, every single one of them could do things that I wasn't able to do. So are they really disabled or are they just simply different? One of the questions is, we need to think about the words we use. We know that even with chronic low back pain, using improper terminology sets up a poor discussion for an outcome. You can actually influence the outcome by the words that you use. And you can also influence the comfort of the individual who you're working with by the words you use. What I do is if I'm ever unsure, I just ask them. And so I asked a Paralympic athlete, how would you like to be addressed? And it was a very interesting discussion. The person literally stopped in their tracks and looked at me and said, thank you for asking. No one's asked me that before. How I prefer to be addressed is just simply an athlete. My disability or dysfunction is 
and this particular individual had bilateral below the knee amputations really doesn't define me, nor should it define me just in a simple conversation. Actually, my amputation shouldn't be talked about unless it's somehow applicable to the topic. So I would prefer you call me an athlete, if necessary, a Paralympic athlete, if necessary, an athlete with bilateral below the knee amputations. So we really are not describing the individual as a disability, but what we're describing is whatever that physical impairment might be or difference that we see. So athletes with disability, hopefully you'll be able to do pre-participation examinations to help them too. So when they went through and talked about some definitions of concerns and beefed up the literature, did some other things like that, but really the core of the content is really found in the first part of this slide of the mental health to female athlete. That's really where the bigger changes were. So why do we even perform PPEs? Well, we perform a PPE to facilitate and encourage safe sport participation. We don't do them to exclude athletes from sport. And as I mentioned, a very small percentage, 0.3 to 1.3% of athletes are actually denied clearance. 3.2 to 13.9% require further evaluation before participation for something that's found. So now we know it's pretty rare to not clear an athlete, and it's actually very uncommon, one in 10, require additional follow-up. The problem is, is that the PPE is notoriously poor at pre-identifying the serious things that list and that lead to sudden cardiac arrest in the patient. So even though they don't really do a very good job, we're still going to do them. And this is where I think that rigor comes into place. When you do a test a thousand times and you never see a positive, well, how often have we just simply quit doing the test? That won't work in the PPE because you're screening people with unknown issues. And so we have to make sure that we follow the standard of care and that we honor that agreement between those parents, you as a chiropractic physician, and the student athlete that you're going to do what you're supposed to do. So when we think about maybe some procedures or things that were done in the past that are no longer done, let's look at this. We don't do UAs. We don't do ECGs, uh, which I use that term because of uh, my international experiences. EKG is what should be better for the United States. We don't do lab studies for blood studies. We don't do genitalia examination. We don't do breast exams. We don't do tanner staging. There's a lot of things we don't do, including the UA. So really, if we're looking for these life-threatening problems and we know that the PPE doesn't do a very good job of it, why do we even try? Well, that's what I call the covenant of trust. When a parent makes an appointment with you, the chiropractic physician, to do a pre-participation examination on their child, there's a covenant of trust that is then created. And what the covenant is, is they're going to provide you with some form of reimbursement, even if it's $10. And in return, you're going to meet the standard of care and do everything you can to look at that athlete's health to make sure to the best of our ability with the recognition of the limitations that that individual has been appropriately screened for participation. The covenant of trust is between the parent, the chiropractic physician, and the patient themselves. So when we think about these catastrophic outcomes in sport, we're trying to identify them but we already know that we're going to be unlikely to be very successful in identifying those catastrophic problems. So what are we supposed to do then? Well, you can see the quote or the comment on the bottom of this is we are going to try and focus on what we can prevent or identify, and then we're going to prepare to manage what we cannot prevent. 
So we do need to know what we need to know when it comes to catastrophic outcomes in sport. And that's what the rest of this discussion is about. Let's learn more about catastrophic outcomes together. On this particular slide, it's a pretty famous slide that talks about how high school and collegiate athletes suffer fatalities. I call it the three H's. Those are the things we need to know. Heart or cardiac, head and heat. These three things comprise about 78%, 80% of the causes of why people die in sport. You can look at some of the other reasons, for instance, lightning. We have no chance to help that on a PPE or a cervical fracture or commodial cortis. And I'll briefly talk about that. That's a heart trauma. Sickle cell is something we could talk about. And so heart, head, heat, those are the keys of what we need to be thinking about. So focus on what you can prevent manage to what you cannot prevent. That means having, for instance, an AED on hand if you're going to be thinking about how do you prevent these cardiac problems. And so we want to focus on those 80% head, heart, heat, and recognize those conditions and be able to develop plans to try and ferret out anything we can that might help an individual predisposed to suffering from those types of problems. So common causes of cardiac causes of sudden death in sport include hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that's clearly the most common cause. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is when the interventricular septum, the septum or wall of muscle between the left and right ventricle becomes thickened. Most of the time, this is a congenital problem, but you can also have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as uh, you know, the heart's a muscle. And so as that uh, is trained, it can become larger. The way you tell is when you pull the training away from the training effect, uh, the heart actually reshapes itself to normal. And the people with the kind of a genetic predisposition, it doesn't change. So when the anterior wall of the left ventricle and or the interventricular septum enlarge in size, it affects the ability of the left ventricle to eject blood. The actual death of those individuals is usually secondary to an arrhythmia because of this problem. Coronary anomalies is the second most common cause. Now the coronary arteries, you may recall, take the origin of their blood flow from the sinus of Valsalva found just outside the left ventricle. They then bring over the surface of the myocardium, the oxygenated blood to feed that muscle. Well, the problem is, is that sometimes those arteries perhaps have a abnormal uh, origin from the base of the aorta, or they may cross over one another, or perhaps even bridge down into the myocardium. There's different types of things that can happen. Now, these things are virtually impossible for you to detect on physical examination. If you consider the two most common causes of sudden cardiac death, this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and coronary artery, and coronary artery anomalies, you've got over 50% of the causes. Very frustrating that these things can't readily be detected. It is possible that you could hear an outflow murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy typically found over the right second intercostal space on auscultation or along the or along the left side of the sternum but most of the time there is no murmur for you to hear i mentioned the aed and its importance and it certainly is important the early application of the AED absolutely is directly connected to the survival of the individual. Basically, it's 10% per minute. So if we can get that AED on a person that's collapsed secondary to a cardiovascular issue as soon as possible, their chance of survival really improves. You can see the last bullet. When an AED is applied within one minute, 90% of the patients survive. The problem is 
pretty difficult to have somebody drop and then have an AED on them within 60 seconds. So let's take a moment and I'll let you review this slide because this is the key slide from the entire presentation and you'll see it more than one time because it's really important. The PPE cardiac keys, five steps to meet standard of care. Okay, so the encouraging part is if the cardiac pathology can be identified, 80% are identified through a good history. The blood pressure, well, we all know how to do a seated brachial blood pressure. Pulses, it's a femoral pulse compared to the radial pulse on the same side at the same time. What you're looking for is differences in the intensity of the pulsation, which could be a tip off of a, to a condition called coarctation of the aorta. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Then you have to auscultate the heart and I'll show you the preferred methods. One thing that you'll hear over and over is that the position of your patient for auscultation of the heart is standing and supine, not seated. So while we routinely auscultate people in the seated position, we should switch that up and start having people stand. And then recognizing the clinical manifestations of Marfan syndrome. There's not a one of these five, that is prevented by our scope of practice or anything else. It's just something that we need to be cognizant of and make a conscious effort to make sure that we're addressing these five important areas. History. 80% of sudden cardiac deaths are asymptomatic before the event. Very disappointing, but true. And so what are some tip offs? Well, one of them through the history would be exertional syncope or presyncope. So syncope means fainting, right? So if you have an athlete that says, man, I passed out while I was riding a stationary bike. Well, that athlete you should think has a cardiac problem until it's proven otherwise. Chest pain with exertion. Now, a lot of people have chest pain with exertion, quote the side stitch or whatever you might want to call it. However, <clears throat> the chest pain should be different than their peer group. And if it's located over the sternal area, especially, that's something that you need to take a look at. And remember the principal concept of ischemia. If the person has chest pain on a consistent basis during heavy, intense exercise, well, that person should get worked up. And we shouldn't just assume that it's just simply because they're working hard head so heart head and heat when you think about head injury it's really uh, from hematomas you can't predetermine if a person is going to get a hematoma or not and so when you think of hematomas hematomas form in spaces so in the spine or in the brain you typically would think about epidural hematomas or subdural hematomas. The epidural hematoma <clears throat> forms between the skull and the dura. If you placed an arrow through a person's head, you would pierce the skull, then the epidural space, then the dura, then the subdural space, then the arachnoid membrane, then the pseudospace of the subarachnoid space, which isn't a true space, but it can become one if blood starts to accumulate there, then the pia mater, and then on into the central nervous system tissue itself. So outside of sport, epidural hematomas are the most common brain bleeds. And within sport, acute subdural hematomas are three times more common. So to be honest with you, in a field setting, in a practice setting, doesn't really matter what the hematoma is because they're all treated the same high flow oxygen and urgent referral to a trauma center. You can't determine or identify these types of things occurring unless perhaps maybe the person had an AV anastomosis and they had headaches or you were aware of these things. And in that case, I don't think you ought to sign the clearance.
think that the neurosurgeon should sign the clearance to participate. These are some signs that it's possible you could see. I won't spend a lot of time on it. These signs are consistent with basilar skull fractures, temporal skull fractures. Uh, on the left, you see raccoon eyes, pretty self-explanatory. And on the right, that's battle sign. It is possible you could see both of these. Normally, the raccoon eyes would be many days old, perhaps a light brown, green, like a typical bruise before they come to you. And they might tell you that they were taken by an ambulance to the hospital and they have a skull fracture and they could present with an old looking bruise. The battle sign could be much the same or perhaps a little bit different. I have seen battle sign as the identifying physician on a case of uh, domestic abuse. It does take energy to cause injury to the skull. And uh, in my particular case, the individual had their head run through, uh, ram through a sheetrock wall. So significant trauma is necessary. Battle sign. Raccoon eyes. So then there's heat. Now on the PPE, you're really not going to be able to prevent a heat injury, except for people that already have had one or have had one recently. Those are, those are important things to note. So when you think about heat injury, there could be many different types of heat injuries. You could have heat cramps, heat exhaustion, heat syncope, or heat stroke. And the one that we really care about is exertional heat stroke. So remember that typically we're taught in our DCP program that people in heat stroke are, are no longer sweating. Well, that's not true because there's two different types of heat stroke. There's classic heat stroke, which is a, typically an elderly person who becomes ill during a hot time of the summer and uh, they sweat off their plasma in their blood, which then you, once it's gone, they can no longer perspire and they start to build up their heat. However, in sport, you can build up heat faster than your body can dissipate it. That's how come on a hot, humid day when we sweat, the sweat sits on our skin, doesn't actually evaporate, and therefore we're unable to cool ourselves effectively. So heat injuries, many types, the one we are primarily concerned about is exertional heat stroke. So it's one of the top three causes. Heat is one of the top three causes of sudden death in sport. And recently we've continued to have problems just simply taking care of people during the heat. The way you manage the exertional heat stroke, the best way is emergent cooling, hopefully in a big tub of ice water and you activate EMS and try and get that core temperature down. If the core temperature exceeds 104, it's by definition heat stroke. So preventing exertional heat illnesses has to do with recognizing the environment that the event's going to be in <clears throat> and then providing plenty of fluids and watching out for individuals who get into trouble. Sickle cell, now we look at our slide, we've done heart, we did head, we've done heat, and now we're looking at sickle cell. So the reason we want to look at sickle cell, even though it only comprises about 5% of catastrophic outcomes, is because it's continuing to persist. And I think it's a pretty interesting disorder. So sickle cell trait is not an illness. It's an inherited disorder of the red blood cells. So remember, it's not an illness, it's just an inherited uh, trait where the red blood cells under certain circumstances turn into a sickle shape instead of a biconcave disc. Much more common in African Americans, less common in Hispanics and Caucasians. So you, you could have any person potentially be a sickle cell trait carrier, However, it's our African-American athletes that we primarily worry about. Let's learn more why. In this slide on the 
image to the right, you can see the biconcave disc of RBC. And then you see the one that's sitting lower left that looks basically like a sickle or the thing that you would use to cut down weeds. So the red blood cells, they're made to kind of slide by each other in the fine circulation. The problem is, is that when the RBC sickles, that they stick, they lose that ability. And then they essentially start to clot off the circulation, which then results in ischemia. So you can picture this little artery running along. All of a sudden, all of the sickled cells start to come into that artery it gets down into the smaller circulation and they plug up the hole and then the tissue further down can't receive oxygen so in this image you see at the top left of the picture just simply a muscle and then you have muscle damage and when the muscle is damaged then those things go into the bloodstream eventually they get pushed through the high pressure system of the kidney and they plug up the loops of Henle so that the individual is no longer able to produce urine. So we know that if you do a UA and you see protein in it, that's not normal. It's possible to have chronic proteinuria, but typically proteins don't pass through the loop of Henle. Uh, smaller things do. And so when you have muscular damage, myoglobin, a protein, is released into the bloodstream. And the myoglobin then goes to the kidney and starts to plug up those loops of Henle. When the person's urine is actually looked at, it's called coca in color. It's not red, it's not yellow, it's kind of a brown yellow, sort of a Hershey's look. So the sickling can become life-threatening when the sickling occludes kidney perfunction, performance, and uh, it then becomes very serious. Now, the 10 of the last 15 traumatic NC, non-traumatic, excuse me, 10 of 15 of the non-trauma-related deaths in the NCAA were from sickle cell trait. So, what are the times when the person's in trouble? for a sickle cell crisis? Well, it's more likely at the beginning of the season. It's more likely at high altitudes. It's more likely when they're really, really working exceptionally hard. You know, some athletes just simply work harder than others, but the person that's giving a superhuman effort, they're the individual who's likely to develop the sickle cell trait, which you can see at the bottom. So what are the key takeaways for this sickle cell trait? So you have a person that comes in, they're African-American, you look at the history, the history says they have a positive for the sickle cell trait. So should they be removed from, from sport? And the answer is no. And in fact, it may be illegal if you attempt to remove that person from sport. So remember, sickle cell trait is not a disease. It's an inherited disorder, and uh, it's also not benign. It can lead to death, and there's many different triggers that can contribute to the collapse. Dehydration, superhuman effort, going to altitude early in the season. Those are some examples. The other thing is, is in some places, it's, it's just flat out illegal to deny people the opportunity to participate in sport because of some sort of congenital disease like this. So a lot of things to think about. Fipidipidus was the first athlete to die. Now in the marathon, there was a big battle exactly why this guy was running back naked to tell people the outcome of the battle. I have no idea. You think he'd at least wear sandals. And so he came back to report to the deities and to the heads of the state, joy to you, we've won, he said, and then he died. So most people think that Phippidipides was the first person to die as an athlete. So when we go back to the PPE, what are we focusing on? Well, we're going to focus on exertional symptoms, things that are made worse with exercise, like 
the syncope, the presence of a heart murmur, the appearance of Marfan syndrome, or a positive family history. But the physical examination really should focus on those cardiovascular systems that we just described, and also take a look at the muscular system for people that have had prior injury. Once again, a key point to think about is how do you predict injury? Because that's essentially what we're trying to do is predict it and then prevent it. The best predictor of injury is a history of a prior injury. So 30 million athletes are going to get this PPE. They'll all be under 18 typically. And then there's 3 million of these athletes that'll have some special needs that need to be evaluated. My recommendation is that you treat them pretty much all the same and be aware that we do want to keep people active. We want to avoid overly being conservative where we're restricting an individual's opportunity to participate in sport. The goals of this presentation, we're gonna talk a little bit about the American Chiropractic Board of Sports Physicians pre-participation stand. We're gonna talk about the purpose, how to do it, how to, what are some of the key things you might hear on history, how to perform that cardiac exam, and then developing a strategic way to approach that clearance decision. So the keys to clinical practice that one, I had mentioned this priorly, this is your data slide here, that we want the individual to have the PPE six weeks before the activity starts, and that everybody that has a PPE needs to have a really good history. They need to be checked out seriously. Uh, they'll have a blood pressure taken. People with asthma will know if they're asymptomatic at rest and exertion that they can participate. And then we're not going to be screening with laboratories. So when you think about sports, sports are classified in two different ways. One is by physical contact and the other is by demand on the heart. So here you can see a couple sports I just sort of randomly picked. And then we would want to put those sports in the columns of collision, contact, or limited contact. So collision sports basically are sports where people intentionally collide with each other or objects or other <laughs> animals. For instance, uh, rodeo is a collision sport. You can also be thrown from rough stock onto the floor of the arena. That's a collision too. Contact sports, they routinely have contact with other athletes or inanimate objects but usually with less force. Good examples are like a pick or a screen in a basketball game. And then limited contact sports are sports where really um, there isn't a lot of contact between the athletes and other things. You could say, for instance, with tennis, when the ball contacts a racket, maybe that's a limited contact, but really the contact is much, much different. And I think you get the general gist between these. The other way you can classify sport is by their cardiac demand. And the cardiac demand is divided into two different ways to look at it. On the far left, it says increasing static component. Well, what does that mean? That means that uh, rising from a chair is less than is water skiing, which is less than performing a deadlift. It doesn't involve pulse rate, it involves intrathecal pressure. And then you can look at your dynamic component here and essentially that is pulse rate. So low might just be playing golf and then something a little more strenuous, perhaps ping pong or table tennis and then something really strenuous like cross country skiing. So think about the different types of demands of sport. There's two ways to classify it. One is by physical contact. The second way is by the demand on the heart structure itself. So let's recall the goals again, and re I'll let you read this slide. Why are we doing the PPE? All right. 
let's keep these things in mind as we continue the presentation. So if we want to help maintain the health and safety of the athlete, both during training and competition, well, we'll have to take a look at quite a few different things to make sure we're able to do it. Look at the third bullet. Physicians performing PPEs must also be capable of fulfilling the goals and objectives outlined for a PPE. Well, you can do that. For instance, if you have to render a diagnosis, you have licensure to do so. And so here we go. What are the five cardiovascular keys to the PPE? Let's think for that. Let's just think about that for a second. I have shared this with you. The five keys to the PPE for the heart are history, seated brachial blood pressure, palpation of the radial and femoral artery on the same side, auscultation of the heart, and recognition of the clinical manifestations of Marfan syndrome. What are the two most common cardiac killers of the athlete? Well, number one by far is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and number two is coronary artery anomalies. And how do you arrive at the clearance decision? Well, that one we haven't talked about, and that's what the next part of this presentation is going to talk to. Secondary objectives of the PPE is just to simply give these people a chance to talk about anything, receive your counsel on health-related issues, and be able to perhaps look at the fitness level. The fitness level of the athlete is not a part of the standard of care, but if you work in a gym or if you have a performance type area associated with your clinic, it's a good opportunity to introduce people to those services. So con uh, detecting conditions that predispose a person to injury, potential life-threatening or disabling conditions, and if they have something that's really dangerous, basically there's two things. You can have an absolute contraindication to sport, which means they absolutely can't play, or a relative contraindication, which means if this, then that. For example, if the athlete has uh, one eye, and their sport is swimming and they're able to wear goggles when they swim well that would be a relative contraindication their one-eyedness however they could participate under those types of requirements and then number three address legal or insurance requirements basically every school demands uh, their carrier will demand that a ppe is performed it helps to mitigate loss but uh, we need to think about how do you get the form when it's completed from your office to the high school? <clears throat> well, just because the form has a special name of the PPE, it doesn't change much. It's still a medical document. And really the only person that can release that document is the parent. So you can't just take over 50 PPEs and just drop them off to the athletic director. That's not how it works. You have to have the release to provide that information to the high school or the junior high, whatever. But remember, it is a medical document with protected health information on it, and it must be treated as such. So when we look at the general health status for a lot of athletes, the, I would say more than 50%, they're not even going to see another doctor that year. It's especially true of athletes from low income families. And so it gives us a great opportunity to just simply step back for just a second and look at everybody's overall health to make sure if there's something we can do to help them be healthy, that we're able to help. You can also talk to the athletes about, oh, proper training techniques, like don't lower your head during the tackle, the dangers of chewing tobacco or vaping, whatever it is that seems to be something that resonates with you that you think young people should know. The assessment of the fitness level typically isn't part of the PPE, but it might provide some useful information. So then how do you perform it? Well, there's two different overall strategies to perform the PPE. One is in the office, and the other one's a station or group type setting. 
Well, in my opinion and the opinion of most people, the office-based PPE is much better because if you have a problem, you can follow up with it. It's much quieter. It's much more controlled. It's much more regulated. It is, however, more expensive. The disadvantages is it takes a lot of time to do a good PPE and you wouldn't do it if you aren't going to do it well. And so the demand for the PPEs, you might not have the space on the schedule to do it. And not all, not all of us even, even want to do it, which is fine. You just send them to a colleague that likes it. But it's really important that we have good communications throughout the personnel that are involved with the student athlete. So office-based PPEs have some disadvantages. It's kind of tough when you have a gymnast and then the next individuals a football player and the next individual is a basketball player it's a little bit but in essence it's never bothered me and i think that's probably overstated so you know i really am an advocate for office-based ppe the station-based ppe's the main advantage is you can knock out a whole bunch of them in a little while and it's very cost effective so maybe all the healthcare providers from your community come together to perform station-based PPEs. What's really interesting is who signs it. So you can sign your particular area, but in the end of the day, one physician has to sign off on the form that says they're good to go. Disadvantages is, you know how it is, anytime you get 15 young people in a room, someone's gonna be messing around doing something. It's not really a great environment to hear. I think it should be more of a medical environment and this is a serious business. And I think that the environment it's performed reflects that. So station-based PPEs, you can do them in about six stations. And then the history form is just carried along with the patient as they move from station to station. The disadvantages are uh, it just, it's hard to get clinicians together to be able to do it. It's hard to keep order. I would say that those are the two biggest ones. So what are the basic stations? Well, you have a sign-in station, your history, intake, and review, height, weight, vital signs, the physical exam, and then the assessment and clearance decision. Now, the most uh, senior doctor or the doctor with the most experience performing the PPE, those should be the people that actually sign off on the form. You can also have some optional stations, not really discuss that much, but if you wanted to, you could. Remember, laboratory tests are controversial and they're not part of the standard of care. Back in the days, I've done personally a couple thousand PPEs, but back in the old days, we used to do UAs on them. And I think that I probably had 2000 UAs that I did and I had maybe two positives one was glycosuria, so we found diabetes that was important and uh, couldn't even recall what the other one was. But nevertheless, big labs is not a big part of the PPE. So extensive cardiopulmonary testing for routine screening in the PPE is not recommended. Well, what's extensive? Well, typically extensive would include uh, diagnostic ultrasound and perhaps an EKG. So these laboratory things, don't forget that sometimes people are gonna share with you they have an infection like HIV or HBV. Now these two conditions are commonly talked about, but really, really rare to have transmission of a blood-borne pathogen like those two through sport participation. And so you have to make sure that you protect the individual's privileges regarding their condition, but you're also honest in your recommendations. Once again, so what's new? Well, we talked about this slide before, and let's just move on. So five to 10% of your people that you see, adolescents or who the physicals are on, will have a chronic condition. And most commonly, it's going to be hypertension. So these legal issues where if you don't follow the standard of care, you can have a problem. You can also have legal issues associated with the release of protected health information and FERPA, 
FERPA has it has to do with those that are typically in college, but FERPA is basically the protection of the individual's information through the school system. For if you had a, for instance, a student that was in a college that was your daughter, or your son, or your child, and you called that college and asked what their grades were, they wouldn't tell you because of FERPA. So that's just supporting the idea that the PHI of the athlete's medical record should be hand delivered. Okay, so we know the health history is important. But what are the most important questions that you should ask? Well, fortunately, most of them are right on the form. And so it's a pretty easy question. You just simply have to read and make sure that everything has been answered. So to get the best history, the athlete and the parents complete it together. The parent has to sign it and you should review the history before you do the examination because those baseline questions are so important. At the very bottom of this slide, that's a cut right out of the Oregon uh, PPE form where it states that both the signature of the athlete and the signature of the parent, and that should be dated. Make sure this is actually done. It also includes uh, Oregon rules statute uh, 336.479, section one, subsection three. And in this, it states clearly that if you look at E, a licensed chiropractic physician who has clinical training and experience in detecting uh, cardiopulmonary disease and defects is able to do this. That's you, that's the statute, that's what gives you the right to do the PPE in Oregon. Look to learn. So this is a couple of my past chiropractic interns and you can start gaining information clearly as you would already know as soon as you lay eyes on the individual that you're about to examine. They should wear athletic attire. Have them come to the PPE wearing athletic shorts and tennis shoes, something that they can easily be worked with. So here's some common questions about hospitalization and surgery, medications, pills, ask specifically about nutraceuticals, learn about creatine, things like that, any allergies, the, have you ever fainted during exercise, dizziness with exercise, chest pain with exercise, tiring more quickly than their friends, hypertension, or has anyone ever actually told them that they have a heart murmur? So have you ever had racing of your heart or skipped beats? Has anyone in your family died of heart problems or a sudden death, a sudden death meaning a sudden death with no explainable reason before the age of 50? Most of those types of deaths are associated with uh, cardiac problems. And there's a strong inherited connection of cardiac problems. Do you have any skin problems, itching, rashes, acne? Gives you a chance to help people out there. Have you ever hurt your head before? Have you ever been knocked out or unconscious? Have you ever had a seizure? Now the seizure one we're gonna specifically talk about is what do we do with individuals who have had a seizure? How, are, can they play sports? And you're gonna find out the answer to that. Uh, number 17 is a good question. Stingers, burners, or pinched nerves. Please recall that if you have people that have repeat burners or stingers, uh, which in doctor's terms, we would say a neuropraxia of the upper extremity, those people, maybe you should think about ordering cervical spine x-rays. There's a significant correlation between central canal stenosis and the individual who has repeat stingers or burners. Have you ever had a heat or muscle cramp, ever had heat problems or muscle problems, ever been dizzy or passed out in the heat? This is just to simply identify those individuals who are predisposed to heat related injuries. Number 20 is the asthma question. Uh, it's really important that we understand that asthma is a dangerous disease and it still does kill people. 
Do you have any special equipment or braces? If they do, you'll have to do a focused examination on that region. Problems with your eyes or vision. I don't know about you, but I now people can wear contacts and I can't even tell they have them in. So I have to ask the question, do they have them? Do you wear glasses? Do you wear contacts? Have you ever had a joint injury? Uh, the number 25 is kind of interesting about uh, infectious mononucleosis. So if they've ever had it, well, that's one thing. If they've had it relatively recently, say within the past six months, make sure on your physical examination of the abdomen, you specifically look for the spleen and for hepatomegaly. So the liver border should be no more than two fingers breaths below the costochondral mar margins of the right side of the thoracic chest. The spleen is found in the left upper quadrant in really skinny people, you can palpate the spleen, like really thin people, for instance, maybe a small gymnast. But if you can feel or palpate the spleen in a normal body position or person, uh, you would have to consider splenomegaly. To further work that up, the preferred imaging is diagnostic ultrasound. You know, CT scans are invasive but diagnostic ultrasound would do a nice job in identifying hepatosplenomegaly. If they do have hepatosplenomegaly, they should be disqualified from sport participation until that time that the organs have returned to their normal status. Other types of medical problems, uh, your first menstrual period, that has to, you know, I don't know about you, but I've been in practice quite a while and the day of menarche is about three years earlier than when I started. Way back in the early 80s, it was pretty common that it would be a middle school girl, maybe in the seventh grade, give or take a bit. That's when she would start menarche. When now you see individuals in the fifth and sixth grade starting menarche. Some people say it's because of environmental hormones. And frankly, I tend to agree with it. So if they haven't had their menstrual cycle by the age of 16, that's called primary amenorrhea. And uh, some evaluation should be considered to identify why she hasn't started her menses <clears throat> by the age of 16. Once the individual, uh, the woman, the female, has had three consecutive menstrual cycles a month, and then it stops and it's not associated with pregnancy, then that's called secondary amenorrhea. So if they have three menstrual cycles on three consecutive months and then it stops, then your patient has secondary amenorrhea. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the stuff on the forums. Here's the link to your form. And if you want, I'll pause for a moment or you can pause this presentation so that you can go online and download the form to follow along with us. So when you perform the PPE, use the form. The form is a perfect roadmap to what you need to get done during this patient encounter. And it emphasizes your areas of greatest problem. It also does a nice job making sure that you ask the correct questions. Performing the head examination, really it's about the eyes. So here's one of your questions that I posed in the beginning with a female athlete with the glasses on. And I asked, which visual acuity, when does a visual acuity become an issue? And the answer is, if the corrected vision in an eye is greater than 2040, then that's a problem. So in other words, it's not all that uncommon. You could have somebody with an eye problem where when they put their glasses on, their best corrected vision is 2060. Well, that individual is then considered a one-eyed athlete. Do you get it? So if they have 2040 or better with their corrected vision, in other words, with their contact in or with their glasses in, no problem. But if it's greater than 2040 using your Snell and eye chart, then you have to have a discussion with the parent that they would already know, but your child either needs to have an eye exam to get their corrections updated, or if they are correct, you need to have the discussion about protecting the eyes uh, 
Now the deal is, is that if it's a unilateral problem, which it typically is, and so if one eye is 2020 and one eye is 2060, the problem is, is if they lose the 2020 eye and then you have a 2060 best corrected, well, you can't drive a car with that. So it's a pretty important thing. Look at this youngster. What's the name of this condition? Here we are with our head exam. What is that? Well, that's called anisocoria. Now, what's interesting in this case is you can see an abrasion above the left eyebrow. When you have anisocoria in the presence of trauma, it could be a pathologic change in eye size. About 15% of us have a difference in our pupil size. And the way you differentially diagnose a pathology from just simply asymmetry is by using your pen light. If you shine the pen light in the eye and the pupil constricts, well, then that's not a pathologic reflex. As a side note, did you notice that one eye, you can see the red light reflex and the other eye, you can't. That's another sign of anisocoria from a head injury because the eyes don't converge correctly. So anisocoria, unequal pupil size. This uh, says about 20% of us have it and we want to note it on the form. It's normal, anisocoria, it's normal, but you can just simply note asymmetrical pupil size. It's important that we understand that. So when you look into the mouth, you're going to look for skin cancers, oral cancers. You know, the, it's unfortunate, but the incidence of oral pharyngeal cancer is really increasing. And uh, it's related to the uh, practice of oral sex and the passage of the human papillovirus into the oral pharynx. So you just want to do a good examination of the individual's mouth, looking for even things like uh, cavities, abscesses, you know, maybe they haven't had a chance to see a dentist and maybe you can help them get to one. Now we're looking into the ear and you can see this one shows an exostosis at seven o'clock on the external auditory canal. So this is just an extra kind of a bony formation down there and it's really not anything you need to worry about or treat. What you should look for is the conus of cone of light that's typically seen on the inferior aspect of the osseous structures. Oftentimes you can look through the tympanum to the round window, but you just want to do your typical great job of doing an otoscopic exam. You could also consider doing Weber's and Rene if you felt. So this one is more like a really nasty fungal infection associated perhaps with swimmer's ear. Uh, more commonly though with swimmer's ear, here you can see some scarring on the tympanum. That's the sclerotic areas in there. But typically with swimmer's ear, it looks like little pepper, kind of like what you see in the foreground here on the very early part of the entrance to the external auditory canal. And so you'll see these little black dots. What those little black dots are, they're fungus. And it's because the ear is wet and it's a great place for bugs and stuff to grow in there. How you defeat that is have them make a mixture of 50% hydrogen peroxide and water or 50% uh, isopropyl alcohol and water. And when they come out of the pool, they put a couple drops in each ear. It'll dry the ear out and then it won't be a fun place for these things to live and they'll get better. So the ear exam, make sure you scan it. Think about using your tuning fork. And I would really only do that if the person seems to have a hearing problem. Then when we come to the neck, you're going to check for lymphadenopathy by palpating the submandibular lymphs, the anterior cervical chain, posterior cervical chain, which are found on either side of the SCM. Also check the sentinel node found in the left supraclavicular notch. Palpate the thyroid for thyromegaly, any lumps, any bumps. Check the carotid pulses and keep moving. That may sound like a lot, but you can do that in under 10 seconds. For the nose, it's usually not a source of pathology, but it can be a source for function. You just have them occlude each nostril and breathe through their nose with their mouth closed and make sure that they have an open and patent nasal passage. So what does the ACBSP, the American Chiropractic Board of Sports Physicians, say about the PPE? Essentially, what they say is that
If you're certified in sports with a sports diplomat or a CCSB, you're qualified because you're trained and tested on the PPE. If you're not board certified, it, it's really based upon your experience, your qualifications, your understanding of what needs to be done, and your ability to execute on those standards. So let's get into the heart a bit, because that's important. When we think about you know, cardiac sounds, the cardiac exam, do you recall what's the most important component for yield of the cardiac exam? Well, it's the history. So your cardiovascular exam starts with a really good health history. And remember the principal effect of exercise. What that means is that if you have an individual that has increased chest pain, dizziness, syncope, passes out with exercise, you should assume it's cardiac until you prove it isn't. And so sudden cardiac death really doesn't happen that often, but when it does, it's just simply catastrophic. Having some young person literally in the prime of their life die, that's really sad. And it's also sad that all the screening procedures we do hasn't touched the incidence. It just doesn't work. But we're going to do it anyway because that's our covenant of trust. And so you can see that you have to have a careful history. We know hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what it is, and that it's number one. And so what is the standard of care on this cardiovascular exam? And can, can a doctor of chiropractic actually do it? Well, they, you can. Here's some athletes that all died and they were all professional or headed towards professional. On the left, that's Pistol Pete Maravich. Uh, he played basketball at LSU before the three-point line and routinely scored 40 points a game. That was at two points a throw. Hank Gathers, <clears throat> all different kinds of people. How many physical exams did these individuals have that they were not able to identify their cardiac pathology? And so once again, looking at heart health, the two most common killers are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and coronary artery anomalies. If you add those two things up, you can see that you've got over 50% of the cardiac deaths are there. And you can look down the list at some of the other cardiac problems, aortic stenosis, channelopathies, uh, aortic rupture, really uncommon. Here's some specifics of the different types of things. CAD, by the way, is coronary artery disease. AS is aortic stenosis. So you can have all these different things that each contribute very small amounts. But if you look at the big part of the chart on the left-hand side, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is at 26%. Coronary R anomalies in this study is 14%. So that's 40. And then you have commodio cortis at 20%. Commodio cortis is when there's a sudden trauma to the chest that stops repolarization and puts the person either into V-fib or asystole. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What do we need to know? Well, it's normally asymptomatic until they have a problem. The most common genetic cardiac disease, more common in African Americans, most common cause of sudden cardiac death. And if you have a family history of it, it's a pretty important thing that you check it out. This is a good slide. This is from the AHA or American Heart Association. And it talks about what they think the pre-participation cardiovascular examination should do. Let's look through this number. Uh, the first section is the personal history, chest pain, syncope, uh, difficulty breathing, dyspnea, prior recognition of a heart murmur, elevated blood pressure, the family history, sudden unexplained death of somebody under the age of 50, disability from heart disease in a close relative younger than 50, or knowledge of specific problems like long QT syndrome, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or Marfan syndrome. One through eight, all historic problems anybody could identify, but you have to look for them. So are you qualified to do this? Well, you're qualified one through eight. Let's look at 9, 10, 11, and 12. 
Nine, physical examination of the heart murmur. This is important. The auscultation needs to occur in the standing or supine or standing and supine, but not seated positions. That's important. Most auscultations that I've observed are done with the patient seated. That's for our convenience, but they should actually be standing or laying down. The femoral pulse is compared to the radial pulse on the same side. Physical stigmata of Marfan syndrome. Uh, there's at least 20 different physical characteristics. Just for fun, think about how many you can name right now. Brachial blood pressure. Once again, 1 through 8, 9 through 12, not a single thing listed that we couldn't do. So innocent heart murmurs, that's always interesting. Typically, innocent heart murmurs are also known as a physiologic murmur and that they're safe murmurs and they're benign and they're faint and they're hard to hear and they're really reflecting no problem to the patient. Well, that's, that's basically what we've operated on for many, many years. However, today we're going to talk about a new study that kind of stirs the pot. Well, what about your chiropractor can't hear a heart sound that's up? That's not true. And so look at this study that was done and published in Current Sports Medicine Reports. And what it talks about is that everybody agrees, yeah, we got to listen to the heart. But very few clinicians can actually accurately detect abnormal heart sounds. So you can listen to the heart, but even if you're trying really hard, odds are you're probably not going to hear it uh, and, and be able to accurately call the murmur. So if it's a pathologic heart murmur, anybody who tries will probably hear it. Whether you can call it and name it isn't relevant. What the point is, is find it. And if you find it, refer the patient to cardiology to get that worked up. So the only people that actually can listen to a heart routinely call the heart sound by name with accuracy are cardiologists. The rest of us really can't name it and nor do you need to. So look at the third bullet. When 95% fail to demonstrate the skill it takes to do this, kind of leads to the basic question, how does any normal hearing adult learn to recognize new sounds like a heart murmur? Well, I think that's a pretty interesting question because it isn't a factoid thing. You know, your brain is full of all these different little factoids that help us to diagnose and manage our patients. But listening to a heart murmur, that's a different kind of, that's a different kind of brain function. I think that people who are musicians might be better at being able to recall it. But you typically have to hear a heart sound 500 times before you become familiar with it. Now that's not the same heart sound on the same patient 500 times. That's You have to hear that sound. And so the odds of us requiring proficiency in naming the heart murmur is really not significant. The whole point is learn normal, and if it's not normal, get it worked up. So clinical experience doesn't correlate well with the skills. So even though I've been in the business for 40 years, it doesn't mean I'm going to be any better than you are. The only thing is, is I know where I'm supposed to listen. Except for cardiology, people just don't get better. After their third year of residency, they don't get any better unless they're a cardiologist. So how do we detect cardiovascular? problems. Well, we detect it through the history. And so this is how the scale is to measure. And so when you listen to a heart and you can hear a murmur, you rank it over a six scale as a fraction, one over six, two over six, etc. The one over six is a really faint murmur. Cardiologists would pick them up. You would pick them up if you're in the zone with a great stethoscope in a quiet room. Number two is a bit louder, but it's still soft. But it is, it is audible when you put the stethoscope on the person's chest. Number three is you actually have a pretty loud murmur. It's easily to detect, but there's no palpable thrill. That means a vibration on the side of the chest wall, which is created through turbulent uh, blood flow. Number five 
is our number four is a loud murmur and if you put your hand on the side of the chest ball you actually can feel the vibration of the turbulent flow five is you just put the edge of the stethoscope the the diaphragm just the edge of it on the chest wall and you can hear it and then six is you actually hoover you don't even put it on the chest wall and you can still hear it so listen four five and six are always pathologic and three sometimes are and that's what the levine scale is it's been uh talked about it's accepted that's how it works but now recently there's been a new wrinkle there we, we know that this sudden cardiac arrest is a leading cause of death and that we want to find it but most of the time you can't find them and so then what we need to do is make sure that the school has a thorough uh, emergency plan to be able to take care of it should it occur basically the AED so what's the word on EKGs and this ties into that Levine scale comment I made so it's not part of the uh, pre-participation exam I had two sons that played American football I had I ordered EKGs on both of them as well as echocardiograms now or excuse me as well as a diagnostic ultrasound of the heart so in the US an EKG is not part of the PPE because of cost and because of false positives the EKGs that I ordered hundreds and hundreds at the USOC they were all abnormal as read by the machine and the reason is that the athletes are so well conditioned they all basically have bradycardia so there's a lack of consensus of when to order an EKG but if they have a positive health history for instance yeah I passed out when I was running a mile run and I don't know why that happened that person needs an EKG uh, they had a positive event um, they the same athlete a, a syncope with exercise is a positive event but what about murmurs and so we know that four five and six for sure they're going to get an EKG they're also going to get a chest ultrasound they'll probably have a chest CT they'll get everything worked up the threes should but what about the new information this is a brand new study that came out in 2019 but it really merits some thought in this study done from the University of Washington by a, a really great group of sports medicine physicians including uh, Kim Harmon and Jonathan Dresler and what they did is they did a study on a big number of thousands of young people young people because the PPE is done on adolescents the question that they were trying to understand is does the presence and character of a cardiac murmur in adolescents associate with structural heart disease with risk of sudden cardiac death and so what they're saying here character and presence that's the one to six thing and so I'm telling you that it's taught to me that if it's a one over six or a two over six they're innocent and so what they did is they just kind of looked at those murmurs that are called physiologic or just simply uh, non pathologic and they wondered what happens if you get the EKG on them and so what they found is is that the one over six and two over six doesn't really work to rule out pathology and that you really need to get EKG on these people very interesting study uh, I think that what's your takeaway we should lower our threshold for referral for additional studies this is something that I personally have I don't really care if you get it or not but I sure thought it was interesting this is an FDA approved six lead EKG that hooks up to your smartphone you can it costs um, about a hundred and a half hundred fifty dollars but in you just simply place that little thing it's about the size of a pack of chewing gum above the left knee or left ankle you put your thumbs on the silver part and you can catch a six lead EKG and then it interprets whether it's a normal or abnormal this is especially useful in people with histories of AFib so back to the PPE these 30 million people that are getting them and uh, we're trying to protect them and so now let's talk about hypertension 
Well, hypertension is going to be the most common thing you see. You're going to see a lot of people with hypertension that are very young, especially with the new parameters. So now that they've dropped down what is normal as basically what's under 120 and under 80, anything over that you start to get written up for some type of hypertension. And so a lot of young people will have it, but there's things that we need to know. Who's the patients? 42%. 42%, four out of 10 are going to be overweight or obese. And a third are going to be found to have abnormally elevated blood pressures. So this is so sad because obesity and hypertension in adolescent paints a pretty bleak picture for their long-term life. So when we work these people up and they do have hypertension, what are we supposed to do about it? Well, the first thing is, is if you catch it, are you doing the blood pressure right? Remember, you're scary to a young person. Just because you're a doctor, that makes you a scary person. And so you want to get the blood pressure checked. And if it's elevated, you should bring them back on the next day, hopefully free of charge, and get a second blood pressure reading where you can let them lay down for a while. Remember to support the arm, support the arm as in hold it at the level of the heart helps to get a better accurate reading. So as we check these blood pressures and we find out that, holy cow, some of these people's arms are so small and some of them are huge. You need to have a lot of blood pressure cuffs of many different sizes in order to have the correct size for your reading. If you don't have the correct fit, then your reading is off and all you have is bad data. But let's make sure we do it right. Look at this slide. On one slide, the blood pressure is being checked correctly. On the other side, it isn't. I'll give you a second to decide which is which. Well, the image, you can see he's smiling under his mask on the right. That's correct. See his feet are on the floor. The one on the left is incorrect. You're supposed to have the person seated with their feet flat on the floor and their arms not crossed for five minutes before you check their blood pressure. So you could do that while the history is being done and then have a better blood pressure reading. So the influence of hypertension on our practice, what we really need to know is when do we restrict activity? And the answer is when the hypertension is high enough that it has end organ dysfunction. Here's the new blood pressure categories. So, uh, less than 120 and less than 80, you're okay. If you have 120 over 82, well, I guess that's elevated now. Uh, there's all different kinds of debates about why this is. I'm not going to get into that. But when you have people that do fit one of the categories, you should follow them up and get a second reading because just one reading isn't enough. What is in organ damage? Well, if they have hypertension and they, it, it puts stress on the organs like the eyes, the kidneys, and things like that. And so individuals who have end organ involvement, which could also include headache. So if you have a person with hypertension and headache, then that might be a person that you need to get additional help and co-management on to restrict their activities. So what is end organ damage? Well, here's the list of what that is. The most common things, you could do a UA and look for proteinuria on these people. Uh, the thing that we're most likely able to pick up really has to do with the vascular problems. I think it's very difficult for us to see things like retinopathy, but we need to make sure we're checking people out. But headaches, we can see that. We can pick up visual changes uh, chest pain and shortness of breath by history. So we just want to make sure we're checking him out. This is just simply a quick slide from Stanford that shows the blood pressures of a lot of different athletes. You know, bottom is the mean age. The vertical axis is their systolic blood pressure. I was a little surprised that the baseball players were above 124 and wasn't surprised that the football players were. And I was also not very surprised that the running athletes like cross country, lacrosse, and soccer were at the bottom.
This is the 12 point exam from the American Heart Association. Just once again, validating to you, we know how to do this stuff. Here's coarctation of the aorta. I've mentioned it on several occasions now. So coarctation is where there's a narrowing. And if you look at the diagram, you see the little number one pointing to this narrowing of the descending thoracic aorta. Now, most of these people that have coarctation, they actually die as young infants. However, some of them can continue to live and it's very frequently missed. So we need to be keeping an eye out for this. So typically the athlete will have a kind of a failure to thrive sort of a look with coarctation. And it's important that we take a look and make sure that the odds are you'll look your entire career and never see one. But if you do identify it, you'll save a life. Coarctation of the aorta is not an easy diagnosis. Look at this. 30% uh, of people, patients, little pa babies, they die at a median age of 17 days. 17 days from their birth. They don't, they're gone. And in older children, coarctation is missed 85% of the time, even when they're referred to hospitals for murmurs. So it's really important that we keep a keen eye out just to try and help. In older patients, in other words, the adolescent or even older, we're going to see changes in their blood pressures and changes in their from a lower extremity versus upper extremity pulses. And so that's why to rule it out on the physical exam, you palpate the radial pulse and the femoral pulse on the same side. The femoral pulse is found uh, along Popart's ligament which basically runs from the ASIS to the pubic symphysis. You kind of mentally divide that in half, go one finger's breadth down, one finger's breadth medial and deep, and that's the femoral artery. You then compare it to the radial artery of the same patient, same side. And then what you're looking for is a loss of synchrony. So instead of the pulses being they, they feel like this. That asynchrony is the sign of coarctation. Also a significantly weaker pulse is also important. So let's make sure that we look for that as part of our covenant of trust. Um, if you should find it, you're going to have to refer that patient out because they're gonna need some more evaluation. And so some of the evaluation will include chest X-ray and echocardiography. You should send these people to cardiology, not their primary care provider. Look at this person. This is a famous volleyball athlete that I can talk to you about because it's been in the press. This is Flo Hyman. She had Marfan syndrome and she, it was never found. But yet when you look at her, she can see many of the characteristics of Marfan syndrome, including docleocephalia, a long thin head, kyphoscoliosis, arachnodaclia. Yeah, it should have been detected, but because it wasn't, she died while playing uh, volleyball in Japan. So Marfan syndrome has many characteristics and I would really encourage that you become much more familiar with Marfan syndrome. The Marfan syndrome uh, website has some really good information on it. Here's some of the different types of things that you might see commonly and that would include the thumb sign, wrist sign, sternal deformities. And so once again on our five cardiovascular keys, a great health history, check that blood pressure, auscultate the chest, palpate those arteries and look for Marfan syndrome. We can do this. So here we are looking for coarctation pulses. You can see that the doctor has her hand on the radio pulse and the femoral pulse at the same time. And that's how you get that synchrony of the upper and lower extremity. How about chest injury in athletics? Well, you can't prevent it with a PPE, but you should be aware of it. And I just wanted to talk very briefly about commotio cordis or commotio cordis. That's when somebody gets hit in the, in the chest by a ball, normally a round ball, and it stops repolarization of the heart, which then leads to ventricular fibrillation. 
and the person uh, typically will perish without the early application of an AED. Here's something, I had all this depressing news. Well, here's some good news. Survival rate of commodial cordis is increasing and doing much better, and it's because of the early recognition and application of the AED. So they talk about prevention with padding and stuff like that. That really doesn't work. Uh, a third of the people were wearing some sort of type of chest protection at the time of their injury. Sudden death in athletics, it happens and it's a disaster and somebody's gonna be upset, there's no doubt about it, but it doesn't mean it's always preventable. This is just one more time on the 12 element AHA. And the reason I show this to you over and over and over again is to build your confidence that you have the training to do all of these things. When you look at the questions, they're pretty straightforward. Had your doctor ever said you had a heart problem? The reason that's an important question is because if they have, we should check it out. Find out what their heart problem was as it relates to sport. Do you frequently suffer pains in your chest? Once again, think about the idea that it's ischemic pain from a lack of blood flow to the myocardium. Do you often feel faint or have spells of severe dizziness? Now that's associated with some serious cardiac disorders. High blood pressure. This is just not a heart problem, but one about joint problems that might lead you to a musculoskeletal diagnosis. Any other reason? I call it the garbage can question. If your individual's not on a PPE for high school, but if they're over 65 and they want to start exercising, well, these people are known to have a higher incidence of coronary artery disease. So what are the five components of our heart exam? History, BP, recognize Marfan syndrome, palpate for coarctation, and auscultate the chest. We can do this, docs. Cardiac auscultation, we need to make sure that we do it right, though. And remember the positions, not seated. And most people, most clinicians can't, when I say recognize, I mean recognize and name. Most, of, most clinicians can hear it, but it's a technical skill. It's not really an intellectual one. And so it's important that we keep on working because the odds of you hearing 500 pathologic heart sounds is not good. We're gonna work these people up, but remember the supine standing positions, also Valsalva can be used. I wouldn't encourage you to try and differentially assess a heart murmur as innocent versus compensated versus non-compensated by using Valsalva because you basically don't have a lot of experience doing that. Our five essential techniques, we know this. The screening effectiveness currently is not good, but we're still going to try. And when we do the screen, here's some interesting things that we want to make sure that we think about and learn more about and have a better understanding about these different types of cardiac problems that could be encountered. Because exercise for therapeutic reasons, here's some magic numbers for you. 160 over 100. If your patient has a systolic greater than 160 or a diastolic greater than uh, 100, you probably should figure out why before you clear them. The auscultation thing, I think we should practice on this. The diagnostic um, phone app, not quite ready for the heart, but before we're done, I'll bet there'll be, you just put something on the person's chest and then your phone will tell you what they have. So the diagnostic accuracy can be improved, but it doesn't happen very often. Remember, the more you do it, it doesn't necessarily make you any better. Chest auscultation, how do you do it? Special thanks to my interns on this video. You start out by auscultating over the right carotid artery. Then you drop down to the right second, third intercostal space. Then you cross to the left-hand side that's for the pulmonary artery. Herbs point three to four. Tricuspid is found five to six intercostal space. And then you listen for the mitral valve, either in the midclavicular line or just posterior.
Now, if you look at the actual still image to the right, the mitral valve is the most posterior valve of the heart, and it's not necessarily found uh, on the anterior aspect of the chest. So once again, aortic click, aortic pulmonic, herbs point, tricuspid, and mitral. Once again, just reaffirming the importance of the questions that we know now, we've been through these, just re-familiarizing yourself. The first parts of the 12 point exam are all historical. The last four are the procedures that I know you can we just want to make sure that we take care of business and we're going to be just fine. You then auscultate the chest just like you were trained, no big deal. The more you practice doing your skills, the better you will be at performing the skills. The lack of practice is really not acceptable, so you should use people to learn and get better. The abdominal examination, you're going to put the person supine. Uh, their abdomen should be exposed to the ASIS, and you're going to look for tenderness and rigidity. This is just where some of the organs are. See the spleen, left upper quadrant. The liver actually lies under the ribs, and so when you find the liver below that, that could be a problem. Inspection, auscultation, percussion, and palpation. Just go back to Bates or any of your diagnostic uh, studies in order to learn more about how to do the skill sets associated with a physical exam of the abdomen. All different kinds of things that we can look for. The genitalia is not part of the examination. You don't perform it on males or females. Some people will say it's optional on males for a hernia, but actually the new document says don't do that. They said that people with a hernia can participate in sport, but eventually it's going to have to be taken care of. So if the person does have a complaint associated with their genitalia, that should be referred for a second evaluation, probably to their PCP or gynecologist. Genitalia. Don't forget, though, testicular cancer is a leading cause of cancer deaths in young men. The genitalia exam of the females is just not done. This is the tanner staging. It used to be done maybe a long time ago, but it's not done now, where the person's physiologic age is evaluated by looking at the development of their secondary sex characteristics. Name the condition. This is herpes gladiatorum, commonly seen in wrestlers. If those vesicles are not dry, they have to be temporarily suspended from sports participation. The vesicle fluid is highly contagious for herpes. The skin, don't forget to look for skin cancer and abnormal nevi. Musculoskeletal examination, you focus in on the area of complaint. If they tell you that they have a knee problem, then you should evaluate that knee. But the yield of just looking at everything on everybody in an asymptomatic patient, it's really not necessary. So we want to make sure that we follow through and think about their history to tip us off to which joints we should look at. Some people say that a musculoskeletal screen should just be kind of gross movement, squat, walk like a duck, swing your arms around like a windmill. And people even advise not even screening an adolescent for scoliosis. You can do what you want to do, though. So you don't have to do this major examination. Do the focused examination. Spinal screen, I still think that we should do an Adams test at least. Could consider the stork test if they have lower back pain because a lot of adolescents can have stress fractures at the pars interarticularis. This test isn't particularly specific, but I think it's a decent test. Upper extremity range of motion, you can do some gross rotator cuff tests if you want. These are the hand checks. These are important. This is a person that has symptoms of Marfan syndrome. They've got a positive thumb sign on the left where the thumb extends past the border of the wrist. Then they've got a positive wrist sign, the Murdoch sign. Uh, 
on the viewer's right, where the thumb overlaps the fifth digit. So lower extremity, general range of motion. Look for effusions. Do a couple tests if you think you need to, but I'm telling you, you really don't have to unless there's a complaint. Different exams you can consider. Sport-specific exams, I think everybody should have the same exam, essentially. I don't really know a sport-specific thing that really needs to be addressed. Perhaps you do, though, and if you do, by all means, follow it up. The neurologic examination, really for concussion or if they have a history of stingers or disc lesions. Determining clearance, that's the biggest thing. We're going to have unrestricted, restricted, or restricted pending follow-up. And then, you know, we already talked about classification of sports, and so you need to think about what sport do they want to play. As far as illness goes, you want to think about the acute illness, mononucleosis, hepatosplenomegaly, dermatological issues. If they have a contagious disease, you need to pull them out to protect the rest of the team. This is the, uh, used to be the female triad. Now it's called reduced energy deficit syndrome, disordered eating leading to a low BMI, amenorrhea, and osteopenia. There's some really good resources on REDS from the IOC, International Olympic Committee, that's worth reading. Eye disorders we talked about, magic numbers are 20 over 40. Gynecological disorders, you're not going to do a gynecological examination. However, if they have secondary amenorrhea, primary amenorrhea, or a other complaint affiliated with gynecological problems, that's a referral. Heat illness is basically done by recognizing the person with the heat illness and then doing what you can do to protect them from future heat illness. Organomegaly, when it, this is all about the mononucleosis and the hepatosplenomegaly. I told you to work that up by using diagnostic ultrasound. You can use CT also. Don't return until it's normal. Hernias don't limit people. You don't have to check for them, but eventually they're going to have to get fixed. This is an interesting one. If the person only has one kidney, the consequence or loss of a second organ is really a big deal. And I would recommend that you think about referring that one out. Musculoskeletal, we've already addressed. Marfan syndrome, we've talked about. It's a common connective tissue disorder with an incidence between 1 in 5,000 and 1 in 10,000. You have to look for it. You look If you look for it, you have a chance to find it. If you don't look for it, clearly you won't find it. So clinical manifestations... You're familiar with many of these, but let's look at some pictures. I have permission to show you these images. This is a young man. He's in the eighth grade with Marfan syndrome. You have to admit, he doesn't look that different, does he? So arm span greater than height by a ratio of 1.05. Sternal deformities, pectus excavatum, pectus carinatum. Arachnodaclea, pes planus high arched palate, gocleocephalia, a long thin head. They probably will be wearing glasses, but the hand signs are important. They're called Steinbergs and Walker Murdoch. Once again, the hand signs. Look for that. Look for sternal deformities. They're always thin. Cross finger sign. That's where we talked about this already. Wrist wraparound signs. Make sure it goes to the fifth digit. So if the person with Marfan syndrome isn't treated, they typically have an aortic aneurysm, and commonly they'll die by the age of 40, so we want to find these people. There's all kinds of implications about what sport they can participate in. The sport that they participate in should be a sport that's identified by their cardiologist. You wouldn't make that decision for these people. They need to be referred. So aortic root where the problem is, action steps, referral, probably to a major healthcare institution so that they can get worked up and evaluated. So I just wanted to show you this slide. That's where you can learn more about Marfan syndrome. Neurologic disorders, you're going to work them up, make sure that you make those clearance decisions and recognize that the whole point is to save lives. If they have a single organ, 
probably you should refer to the specialty that relates to that single organ, urology for a testy, uh, nephrology for a kidney, ophthalmology for the eye. But uh, if there's a loss of a paired organ, you need to have an informed consent discussion with the parent and the student. If the individual has epilepsy, that needs to be evaluated too through neurology. So there's many things that we need to consider and look at, but this is where the tire hits the road is a clearance decision. And so make sure that you've done a great job of looking at your athlete, protecting them to the best of your ability, and just simply doing a great job. Feel free to send me an email at bmoreau at uws.edu if you have any questions. Bless you and do a great job. Thank you.